quickly go on and then we'll get out of your way. Okay, I'll start sharing my screen. Okay, does that look good? As it looks fine, thank you. All right. Okay, yeah, I'll get started. So my topic today is gonna to be Wowichia mirabilis, and highly unusual cone-bearing plant, the gymnosperm from the Namib Desert in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, southwestern part of Africa in Namibia and Angola. Let's see if I can... There we go. So it's my executive summary. We'll go over all these things uh, during the course of the talk. It's just uh, put up there to give you some idea of where we're going. I'll talk about uh, Wawichia and its habitat. I'll talk about you know, how it was named, its taxonomy, and a fair amount about its evolution and its relatives, and a little bit about cultivation at the end. All right, here's Wawichia mirabilis. Uh, Gunnar and I were talking earlier about whether it should be considered a succulent at all. And I think it's at least an honorary succulent. It's certainly a desert plant and it's uh, maybe a little bit succulent. It's kind of a marginal case. Uh, uh, Doreen Court in her monograph on the succulent flora of uh, Southern Africa, she included Wellwichia in her book in the first uh, edition as a whole chapter. And uh, she kicked it out in the second edition. So she changed her mind about it, but I think it's, of enough interest to a lot of people who grow cacti and succulents that uh, it was worthwhile doing a talk about it. So my topics are gonna be the form of the plant and its development, which is very important to the form that the plant develops as a mature plant. A little bit about the plant and its wild, in the wild and its ecology, um, something about its taxonomy, how it was named, that it's a uh, place in the plant kingdom and a fairly long section about its evolution. Um, there is a little bit of a fossil record for Wellwichia and relatives of Wellwichia. Um, some similarities with angiosperms, which are maybe somewhat misleading, and uh, its relationships in the plant kingdom. And I'll talk about cultivation and propagation and just a little bit about sources and further reading. So here's a young but mature female Wellwichia plant uh, producing seeds. And I'm gonna talk first about how Wawichia develops from a seedling to a mature plant. Um, the way it develops is uh, highly unusual and you know, maybe more so than with other plants, the way it develops is important to understanding really the form of the plant and the highly unusual form of the adult plants is uh, based on how they develop as small seedlings. Um, so here's about a, a couple of week old seedling of Wellwichia just germinated. Those seeds, which look a little bit like uh, uh, elm seeds, but a bit larger, they're you know, maybe an inch or so, inch and a half in diameter. Um, they're winged, they're dispersed by the wind. And if the conditions are just right, which may happen only very infrequently in their native habitat, they'll give rise to a little seedling. A uh, seedling sends down a taproot and sends up two cotyledons. The cotyledons, for the, just the first couple of weeks, have this kind of reddish, orangish color to them. And that's something you see in a lot of plants in new growth, especially tropical plants. Um, that new growth or small seedlings have a reddish tinge to them. And I think the leading hypothesis for why that is, is that it helps to repel herbivores. It discourages... Uh, uh, herbivorous insects from attacking uh, the new growth. After a couple of months, the seedling has greened up and it's got the pair of cotyledons on the side here. It's also developing its uh, true leaves. Um, change the pointer. Yeah, it's starting to develop its true leaves. So it's got the two cotyledons to the left and the right, still green and still photosynthetic. And then the, uh, the shoot apical meristem, the growth growing point at the top of the seedling has produced uh, two adult leaves, two true leaves in between the cotyledons. 
And those two adult leaves are the only leaves that the plant will have for the rest of its life, which might be quite easily in habitat several hundred years. Um, this is about a year old seedling. And uh, the one in the pot here has still got its cotyledons. But those adult leaves have expanded quite a bit. They, they've gotten wider and wider and they've gotten longer and longer. And uh, the unpotted one here on the left, you can see the, the taproot that it's developed. And this one was in a pot. Um, if it had free, sort of free run of uh, the soil, um, that root would have gone down quite deep at this point in the plant's life. So somewhat older plant here, uh, about two years on, and the cotyledons have dried up. The seedling leaves have finished. Um, the true leaves, the adult leaves, have expanded even more. They keep on growing from the, from the base, and they get longer and longer and wider and wider. And you can see in the center here, there's these two sort of uh, angular bodies. And people have called those scale bodies. They've called them cotyledonary buds. It's a little bit uncertain exactly what they are, what the homology of those plant organs are. Um, they might be buds. Or I think they're maybe more likely based on their position. They're a, a second pair of uh, true leaves that never really develop. Um, whatever they are, they, they become stunted at this stage. By this point, the shoot apical meristem, the, the bud in the center of the plant has died. Um, so the plant has kind of decapitated itself. It won't have any more vertical growth. Um, the remaining growth for the plant for the rest of its uh, lifespan is gonna be from the edges of the leaves, from the base of the leaves is uh, where the new growth occurs at this point. Here's a, probably about a 15-year-old uh, Wellwichia plant. So a young, a young plant re reaching its uh, adult form, uh, becoming mature. And uh, the leaves have expanded a lot more. Um, and this is the slide that I've got uh, demonstrating the intercalary meristem, which is sometimes also called the basal meristem. So a meristem is a growing point. Most plants grow from shoot apical meristems at the tips of their shoots. As I said, the shoot apical meristem in Woichia dies off quite early on, and the plant decapitates itself. And the rest of the growth from the plant originates in this uh, basal or intercalary meristem. And that's found right at the base of the leaves. So it's uh, between right where the leaves join the stem. And uh, that's, uh, that's a region of uh, growth of dividing cells and elongating cells. And the leaves grow from that region. Uh, they're almost uh, like they're being squeezed out from a tube of toothpaste. They grow from the base, they get longer and longer. The tips of the leaves eventually die off so the leaves don't get long uh, in sort of an unlimited fashion. Uh, the tips of the leaves eventually die off and kind of wither away, especially in habitat. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, and the stem also expands from that intercalary meristem. So the stem gets wider and wider and the the uh, sort of the diameter of the leaf base increases over the age of the plant. There's a shot of a Wilwichia that I've marked uh, uh, every six months to keep track of how the leaves are growing. I took this photograph uh, this spring and the last mark at that point was this line, which was where the leaf was in December of last year. And then this segment here, this longer segment of leaf was produced since uh, June, 2021. So uh, you'll see that uh, the, the width of these uh, six month marks varies. Uh, the mark that includes the winter months, December, January, February, and into March, uh, tends to be quite short. The plant doesn't grow much in the way of leaf tissue then. Most of the growth occurs during the summer months. So the uh, the mark between June and December is the longer mark. And uh, this leaf, I've got it recorded for the back, back about five years ago. And uh, the five-year-old parts of the leaf uh, back in 2017, those are dying off now and uh, starting to brown up. In the wild and under ideal conditions, the leaf can stay green for apparently a decade, maybe up to 20 years, possibly sometimes. Um, 
in uh, cultivation, it seems like uh, the leaf stays green for maybe five years or so. Okay, so eventually the plant matures and uh, when they reach maturity sort of depends on conditions. Uh, for me in New England, uh, the plants reach maturity at a, probably about 10 years old. Uh, people in warmer climates, uh, people growing them in greenhouses in South Africa or California can apparently get plants to reach maturity and start producing cones in less than five years, uh, maybe even about two years or so. Um, so eventually though the plant reaches maturity, the cones are produced on reproductive shoots that originate kind of near where the uh, intercalary meristem is at the base of the leaves. But inside of the stems, they actually, uh, the buds that give rise to reproductive shoots originate inside of the stem and have to break out through the surface uh, in order to grow out and uh, produce their cones. So uh, we can call them adventitious buds. They're buds that occur in kind of an unusual position, uh, these buds that give rise to the reproductive shoots. And here's a, uh, male and female plants uh, in, uh, with mature cones. Um, so Wawichia is a dioecious plant, which means there are separate male and female plants. So these are the males, which are producing pollen, and the females here, which produce ovules, which will become seeds. So Wawichia is a gymnosperm, it's a cone-bearing plant. And uh, the, the name gymnosperm literally means naked seeds. And that's because the ovules that the female plants produce, um, those are the structures that develop into seeds if the cones are pollinated, are directly exposed to the environment. And uh, like in a lot of gymnosperms, uh, the ovules are produced uh, in cones. So there are protective scales and bracts that uh, do provide some protection to the ovules but some part of the ovule is directly exposed to the environment and pollination takes place uh, directly on some surface part of the ovule. In uh, Wellwichia and some of its relatives, uh, the ovules have a kind of bristly outgrowths and that those grow out from between the cone scales when the ovules are mature and receptive and uh, are exposed to the environment and collect pollen. And the uh, gymnosperm is in contrast to angiosperms. Angiosperms are the flowering plant. And angiosperm means contained seeds or vessel seeds. And uh, in the flowering plants, the ovules are completely sealed in maternal tissue. And uh, the, the tissue that they're in is called a carpal. And that's the part of the uh, reproductive structure in flowering plants that becomes the fruit. So that's uh, two basic groups of seed plants. And we'll get more into that later on. And here's a very large old Wellwichia plant uh, in habitat. And uh, some of these habitat photographs were provided to me by Ushi Pond and Ernst van Jarsfeld, um, who literally wrote the book on Wellwichia and uh, very kindly provided me with some great habitat shots to use in this talk. But uh, in any event, uh, quite old plants. And you see this a little bit maybe in some of the oldest cultivated plants, but to see really good examples, you've got to see them out in the wild. Uh, the stem develops kind of a bowl shape. It becomes kind of a bowl shaped structure. It becomes a uh, concave. Uh, so the, the, ridge, the edges of the, the stem where the leaves are uh, gets higher and higher, I think is how this happens and the, the, the stem as a whole develops this uh, bowl-shaped structure, but you only see that in very old plants. So I'll talk about Wellwichia in its habitat in Namibia and Angola. And this is uh, the big Wellwichia as it's called, uh, near the Southern part of the range of Wellwichia in uh, central Namibia. Um, but one of the largest and oldest plants, it's a little bit hard to get the scale of things from photographs of desert landscapes, but this is a, a big plant, I think, uh, by any measure. It's uh, about four meters across, so, you know, considerably larger than your dining room table, probably. Not a small thing. 
Um, so the native range of Wilwichia is in uh, Namibia and Angola in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. Get the basic worldview here in this map. And so Wawichi is native to the Namib Desert. And uh, the Namib Desert is kind of a special place. It's uh, quite an unusual desert in a number of different ways. It's uh, a coastal desert. It's on the west coast of Namibia, uh, southern Angola. And potentially, how, based on how you describe it, um, it, you might consider the very northwestern corner of South Africa to be part of the Namib Desert as well. Uh, the Richtersfeld, uh, some people consider that part of the Namib Desert in South Africa. Uh, it's quite long, 1,600 kilometers north to south, um, but narrow, only about 50 to 100 kilometers east to west. Uh, rainfall is low, of course. It's the highest rainfall in parts that are considered uh, to be parts of the Namib Desert is about 200 millimeters of rain per year and less than 10 millimeters of rain in the driest part per year. And uh, the driest parts are the coastal regions, right near the coast and the coastal plain tends to be driest uh, in this area. Uh, for reference, uh, 200 millimeters of rain is maybe about a third less rainfall than uh, uh, San Diego gets in Southern California. So, uh, you know, a low amount of rain, but uh, not terribly parched in the wetter parts of the Namibian desert. It's also, for various reasons, uh, kind of a mild desert. Uh, the conditions are relatively mild compared to some of the other, uh, some of the other great deserts of the world. Uh, the coastal areas, especially, are very frequently foggy. Um, many many nights uh, tend to be uh, kind of cool and foggy, and a lot of dew and condensation. And that's because of the Benguela current, which is right offshore. So the, the South Atlantic is quite cold in this area and uh, that causes condensation and fog at night, uh, many days. Um, the Namib is probably the world's oldest desert. Um, it's thought to have been arid or at least semi-arid since uh, practically the uh, end of the age of the dinosaurs. So about 55 to maybe 80 million years ago, uh, the Namib has been uh, arid or semi-arid. Um, temperatures are relatively mild in the Namib Desert as well. And especially in the coastal regions in the northern parts of the Namib Desert, uh, there's never frost. It uh, never gets down to freezing. And it's also usually not incredibly hot. Uh, the Namib Desert doesn't really experience the kind of intense heat that you might get in uh, say the Sonoran Desert or the Mojave Desert in the Southwestern US. Um, it's, uh, some temperatures tend to be on the mild side as deserts go. Uh, the geology of the Namib is also quite varied. There's all different sorts of rock types, uh, nice and schist and granite and basalt, uh, dolomite, limestone and marble and calcrete are carbonate rocks, which would give rise to uh, relatively basic or alkaline soils. Um, some of the gneisses and granites uh, would give rise, sandstones would give rise to fairly uh, acidic soils. Um, so the pH varies quite a bit. Um, the soil, if there is any, there are areas with deep alluvial soils. There's also areas uh, with dune seas that are covered by shifting sand. Uh, well, Wichia grows in most of these areas, not in the dune seas. It's uh, that sort of uh, mobile sand surface is not good for long-lived perennial plants like Well uh, But pretty much uh, Well Wichia can be found on all of these rock types. So it uh, experiences quite varied conditions. Uh, the tillite is interesting. Tillite is fossilized uh, volcanic debris or glacial debris. Uh, tillite is uh, the fossilized uh, leftovers of glaciers, kind of ground up rock and broken stones. Uh, the tillites in Namibia are, at least some of them, date back to snowball earth events, which were periods in the Precambrian where the entire world is thought to have uh, basically been glaciated and uh, sea ice may have gone down right to the equator. Um, but yeah, and Wilwichia will grow in that as well. Otherwise, it doesn't have anything to do with Wilwichia, but. 
it's one rock type that they grow on. All right. So this is a couple of maps from a really kind of amazing paper by Norbert Jurgens and uh, his colleagues that came out just last year. And he looked at the distribution of Wellwichia in its native environment and also uh, the genetics of the plants. So the genetic, genetic diversity of wild Wellwichia populations. And uh, a couple of takeaways from this, the map on the right is uh, the rainfall in the Namib Desert and Wellwichia, which is indicated by black dots and large areas where Wellwichia grows uh, fairly commonly over a large area are indicated by gray shaded areas. So the entire uh, distribution of Wellwichia is in the Namib Desert in areas that receive less than 200 millimeters of rain per year. So desert, true desert environments. Uh, basically the entire population of Wellwichia is within the tropics in the geographic sense. So the uh, Tropic of Capricorn is right down here in the southern part of the map, uh, sort of right over the uh, southernmost populations. So remember we're in the southern hemisphere. So the Tropic of Capricorn down here is uh, the southern limit of the tropics and everything to the north is uh, in the tropics in the geographic sense. Um, as you might expect for a plant that's so widespread, uh, has such a, a length, long distribution here along the coast in uh, the Namib Desert, there is genetic variation from place to place. There's variation in the characteristics of the plants. Um, Norbert Jurgens uh, and his colleagues found a couple of spots indicated by dotted lines here and here and here that sort of divide populations that have kind of limited gene flow with other Wellwichia populations. And they also discovered a very strong geographic barrier to uh, any kind of gene exchange, which is indicated by uh, the solid white bar right here in Northern Namibia. That turns out to be a, a very strong dividing line between separate populations of Wellwichia that really don't have any genetic contact with each other. And uh, that turns out to line up uh, quite well with the description of Wellwichia subspecies, which happened a couple of years back. So uh, these are the two subspecies of Wellwichia, which were described in 2001, and which were, uh, I think, uh, very definitely supported by this paper last year on the phytogeography of Wellwichia. Um, the northern subspecies, Wowichia mirabilis subspecies mirabilis, is on the left here, and Wowichia mirabilis subspecies namibiana, which was described in 2001, is on the right. These are the characteristics of the subspecies. Uh, so the original subspecies, uh, described by Joseph Hooker uh, back in 1862, is the northern Wowichia plants. And so its range is Angola and the very northernmost corner of Namibia. Um, the primary differences in these two subspecies is in the fertile shoots and especially the male cones. So the fertile shoots of the type subspecies, uh, Mirabilis subspecies Mirabilis, are quite short. And the cones are kind of a dark purple brown in color. They're long and skinny, and they have very tightly overlapping scales. So a lot of little scales on these uh, long, skinny cones. Well, which you have subspecies Namibiana, uh, described by Beat Ernst uh, Leuenberger in 2001, is uh, the southern uh, subspecies. So it's from central and northern Namibia. Uh, the fertile shoots are quite a bit taller. Um, it has these long fertile shoots bearing the cones. And the male cones are waxy and greenish or sometimes a bit reddish. And they tend to be kind of, kind of short and stout and not that many cone scales, not quite as many scales as the uh, type subspecies. Um, there was a bit of doubt at first when uh, Leuenberger first published this uh, subspecies difference. It was mostly based on cultivated plants and uh, people had some doubts about whether this would really hold up well in the wild, but. Uh, I think it's been amply confirmed by recent research that there really are two good, two good subspecies of Wowichia mirabilis. Um, as far as I can tell, by the way, most of the plants in cultivation, at least in the United States, 
our Namibian uh, uh, Wilichia mirabilis subspecies Namibiana um, seems to be uh, the main type that we have here in uh, cultivation, in, uh, at least in America. So the plants in habitat, they often live in kind of low-lying areas. And I've got a, a bunch of uh, photographs of the plants in habitat, again, mostly from uh, Ushi Pond and Ernst van Jarsfeld. Um, this is in uh, Angola, Southern Angola, and it's showing Wawichia well, mirabilis, subspecies mirabilis, growing in a dry uh, creek bed, or a little dry riverbed. And that's often the type of environment where you find Wawichia well, populations is in low areas where there's probably some availability of moisture deep underground. So that taproot that develops even in the young seedlings uh, goes down deep underground and can tap uh, underground water to get the plant through uh, dry periods. Here's uh, Wawichia mirabilis in uh, subspecies Namibiana in uh, Namibia. Um, large old plant uh, out on the coastal plain and growing in deep alluvial sand and gravel. So quite a deep soil with, uh, again, probably some moisture available, available in this from the subterranean realm. But which he also grows in rocky areas. This is a male plant in Namibia uh, growing among uh, granitic gneiss rocks, these lighter colored rocks. Um, probably with its taproot down into deep crevices and fissures in between the, the bedrock. A female plant in Namibia growing on kind of a rocky rise again. These rocky areas uh, do receive runoff from the stones, so the, the areas of soil in between the rocks can uh, sometimes be have more moisture available than areas out in the open in uh, desert environments like this. There's a whole population of Wilwichia mirabilis subspecies mirabilis in southern Angola. Uh, again, growing in probably fairly deep alluvial soils here, um, broken up uh, some sand and broken up rock. Um, notice that a lot of these plants look to be about the same size. And that's something you definitely see in Wilwichia and also some other desert plants as well that populations often just seem to be about the same age in a certain area. And that's probably because the plants only establish themselves during periods of really exceptional rainfall. And uh, in normal years, don't establish any new seedlings at all, probably for many years or even many decades at a time. Conditions just aren't right for, uh, there isn't enough water for the plant to send down its taproot and to reach deep underground water and uh, to really establish themselves. So you often get populations like this where the plants are all about the same age in the same stand. And that's uh, because they only establish in really exceptional years, which only happen you know, every few decades, every century or so. Here's a uh, Wilwichia mirabilis, uh, subspecies mirabilis in uh, southern Angola. Um, so the northern subspecies. And this is a photograph from Peter Brains. And uh, this shows another sort of funny characteristic you get in Wilwichia populations, a difference from place to place. The really large plants, the, the giant uh, ancient plants like this, tend to grow on the coastal plain in uh, extremely arid moonscapes uh, without a whole lot of other vegetation. And uh, why exactly this is, uh, people aren't exactly certain. It may be because in these uh, highly arid coastal areas, uh, the Wawichia plants just don't really have much in the way of competition and they can live very long lives. Um, they also don't establish very well, so you don't find many young plants uh, in areas like this with uh, extremely low annual rainfalls. This is a photograph also from Peter Brains, but contrasting to that last photograph, this is uh, further inland where the rainfall is much higher, probably getting close to that 200 millimeters per year mark. And there's a lot of Wilwichia plants and there are a lot of fairly young plants, uh, you know, some varied ages, some evidence of uh, 
newly established plants and younger seedlings. Um, this is more typical of the more inland Wauwatu populations from areas with higher rainfall. Uh, you do get more of a mix of ages and uh, do get more evidence of seedling establishment, but you don't really find any of the, the giant, truly ancient Wauwatu plants that you do find on the coastal plain. Um, and, and this population is probably fairly close to the inland geographic limits of Wauwatu that are determined by higher and higher rainfall. Um, in areas with much higher rainfall than what you have here, uh, shrubs and trees and acacia trees and mopane trees and grasses as well kind of take over and Wauwatu disappears. And it's probably a competition thing. Probably Wauwatu is just outcompeted in areas with higher rainfall than what we'd have in uh, this spot. And uh, Wauwatu uh, can no longer compete with uh, other vegetation and dies out. Well, which uh, people have called it the, the vegetable uh, duck-billed platypus because it has uh, such a strange mix of characteristics and some characteristic, characteristics that at least at first glance don't seem to be uh, really matched to its environment. Um, well, which it does have these very broad leaves, which is quite unusual for a desert plant. They have a lot of leaf area, but these leaves do have adaptations to living in a desert environment. So they have sunken, sunken stomata, the breathing pores of the plant or the stomates are uh, sunken beneath the surface of the leaf, kind of protected in what are called crypts underneath the surface. Uh, the surface of the leaf, the epidermis, has quite a thick waxy cuticle layer on the, on the top, which prevents water loss and also protecting the plant from excess light and water loss. There's a sort of a granular material, which is called crystal sand, this kind of mineral deposit in the upper surface of the leaf. Um, the leaves themselves are quite tough. If you've seen the leaves of an old Wauwatu plant in person, they're almost like hard plastic. And they have uh, tough thick-walled cells, support cells called fibers inside the leaf, and that's these thick-walled cells here. And they also have a lot of calcium oxalate crystals, like this cluster of crystals here. Another characteristic of a kind of tougher drought adapted leaves. Uh, Wauwatu has cam photosynthesis. So we think of cam as a adaptation to desert environments, uh, which you find uh, pretty much in all the succulent plants and uh, also in marginally succulent plants like Wauwatu. Crassulacean acid metabolism is the ability to uh, open up the plant stomata at night uh, take in their carbon dioxide then when uh, temperatures are cool and evaporation is uh, less than it would be during the day, and uh, then store that carbon dioxide as uh, organic acids inside the leaf. Um, the stomata, the, the breathing pores, close up during the day as when the sun comes up and it gets hotter and drier. The stomata can close up then and the leaf can release those uh, stored, that stored carbon dioxide from organic acids and carry out normal photosynthesis inside of the leaves uh, without opening its stomata during the daytime when sun is available. Um, it's also thought that those large leaves do function in its habitat to catch fog and dew. And it's a little bit uncertain whether they can absorb moisture that condenses on them directly um, they may or may not be able to, uh, but certainly that con condensation would uh, uh, be channeled down to the base of the plant and uh, could be taken up uh, from the ground by uh, surface roots that Wauwatu has. So uh, an interesting thing about Wauwatu is that they can pretty obviously get to be quite old in habitat. Um, exactly how old people have determined in a number of different ways. There are growth lines on the stems. Uh, well, which doesn't have growth rings in its wood like uh, a lot of ordinary trees do, uh, but the surface of the plants, uh, the epidermis and the stems uh, does show annual lines that form during the growing period. Um, so this plant is about 15 years old. And if you count those lines, there's about 15 lines. Um, so that's good for us up to a certain point. 
in older plants, those lines and the, the bark sort of breaks up and the, those lines have to be lost after a certain number of years. Uh, the circumference of the leaf base though, those leaves do increase in, uh, in width uh, at a fairly uh, consistent pace. And so by measuring the circumference of the leaf base, you can get an estimate of the age of a plant. On the really old plants, people have used carbon dating to try and determine how old the plants are as well, um, taking samples from older parts of the stems, the wood or the bark, and uh, getting an age from uh, carbon dating like people do with uh, ancient artifacts as well. And the, the sort of numbers that you find when you uh, use these dating methods is that the sort of smaller mature plants and habitat are probably a few decades to 50 years old or so. Um, very large habitat plants are on the order of 500 years old. And the real monsters like the big Wellwichia here, the um, you know, almost car-sized plants that do occur in the coastal plain are more than 1000 years old and uh, maybe up to 1500 years old or so. Pollination well, which uh, has been uh, kind of controversial over the years, how exactly pollination occurs in the wild. Um, it's now pretty definitively known that pollination in well, which is carried out by insects, that uh, flies and honeybees and other kinds of native bees in the Nano Desert and uh, wasps as well uh, visit the cones. The cones produce some nectar and they're effective at carrying the pollen back and forth between male and female plants and carrying out pollination. Um, this was suspected quite early on because it is obvious observing the plants in the wild that they do produce a little bit of, bit of nectar around the cones. Um, so people suspected insect pollination. Uh, people have also hypothesized wind pollination and other mechanisms, which uh, hasn't really panned out. Uh, and especially uh, this, paper by uh, Wolfgang Wichnig and uh, Barbara Depesch uh, in 1999, um, really looked at the plants in, in habitat and uh, determined that insect pollination was the main mechanism of pollination in Wellwichia. There's a fly and a male Wellwichia cone, uh, getting some nectar from the, between the cone scales. There's uh, in the greenhouse in Connecticut, a wasp visiting a male Wellwichia plant and getting some nectar. There is uh, this uh, insect Wellwichia bugs, which uh, live just on Wellwichia. Um, they're herbivorous insects. They suck sap out of the, uh, the cones and the reproductive shoots, especially. Um, Wellwichia bugs were suspected of being pollinators um, it turns out when you actually look at how they behave in the wild, they don't really move very much uh, between plants. They tend to stay with their home plant and they don't pick up much in the way of pollen. So they're not thought to be effective pollinators of Wilwichia. People have also looked for evidence of Wilwichia pollen being transport transported by the wind and uh, wind pollination also doesn't seem to really occur in these plants. You get other animals associated with, with Wilwichia in the wild. This chameleon is uh, probably looking for the insects that are coming to pollinate uh, these male Wilwichia cones and uh, eating them as they show up. In some of the places where Wilwichia grows, it's uh, kind of the only source of shade. So you get uh, uh, snakes and, and other insects and gecko or chameleons like this guy, um, which uh, live around well which she and are associated with the plants. So, so they're maybe an important part of the habitat structure than uh, areas where well which grows. So well which taxonomy, this is quote that I had in the blurb that got sent out for this talk which you've seen already, but uh, Friedrich Wellwich Velvich was a uh, Austrian botanist and explorer. And he found well which in Angola in 1859. He didn't discover it for the first time, of course. Uh, this part of Southern Africa has been inhabited by people for as long as the species Homo sapiens has existed, as far as anybody can tell. Um, so it was certainly known by the locals long before Friedrich Vilvich came along. 
but uh, he had quite a nice quote about finding it and could do nothing but kneel down and gaze at it, half in fear, lest a touch should prove it a figment of the imagination. So Wawichia was uh, scientifically described as Wawichia mirabilis uh, by uh, Joseph Hooker, uh, an English botanist in 1862. So shortly after Vilvich found the plants. Um, and this uh, second subspecies was named in 2001, as we discussed. And so those uh, two names are the accepted scientific names for Wawichia these days. It's accumulated a lot of common names uh, from the people who live in the habitats where it grows. Uh, variations of the word tumboa, um, that's derived from the name for stump. Now, the Afrikaans name, the Tweeblar Kanidod, and uh, you know, maybe Buck can correct me on that eventually, um, means two leaf cannot die, um, which will seem bitterly ironic to some of you who've tried to cultivate well with you. Uh, the name onyanga is from the name for onion, which refers to the female cones. The young cones can be cooked and are edible. They uh, can be eaten as a vegetable, um, especially, the, especially the female cones when they're kind of immature. It's accumulated a few synonyms over the year. Tamboa from the, uh, one of the native names. Uh, Bainesii is after Thomas Baines, who uh, saw the plants in 1861 in Namibia. And he was uh, an English artist and he uh, produced some paintings and uh, engravings of Wilwichia to, uh, to uh, make the plant famous. So in the Linnaean classification, it's in the plant kingdom, the kingdom planty. It's uh, in the division Netophyta, which are the neophytes, And I'll talk about those quite a bit. Um, Class Netopsida, order Wilwichiales, family Wilwichiaceae, all by itself. The genus Wilwichia and the specific epithet Mirabilis. So the neophytes, this division of the plant kingdom which uh, Wilwichia belongs to, it's a small group of gymnosperms. It's uh, just three genera. And they're kind of distinctive things. They all have uh, unusual cone structures, unusual ovule structures, and uh, kind of a lot of a lot of complexity to their reproductive structures. So it's uh, just three families, each with a single genus: Boetia, Needum, and Ephedra. Here's a, a map of where the Nidophytes occur. We've talked about Boetia already down here in the Namib Desert. Ephedra is a plant of arid areas or semi-arid areas. It occurs uh, in the uh, desert regions in the New World, in the southwestern U.S. and northern Mexico. Um, also occurs in the Mediterranean and Mediterranean type climates uh, in the Middle East and in drier uh, sort of grasslands and steppe type habitats in uh, Eurasia. Um, Ephed or Needham is a plant of tropical rainforests. So it's a tropical rainforest shrub or vine. Um, occurs throughout the tropic, tropical parts of the world. And this is Needham. And uh, it turns out that this is the closest living relative of Wallachia. It uh, can be a vine, it can be a shrubby plant. This is Needham nomen, which is Neman, which is a uh, small tree. It's also dioecious. Uh, most ephedras and needums are also dioecious, like Wawichia. It's a male plant on the left and a female plant with ovules developing and a, sort of a fruit like structure on the outside that actually bracts or modified leaves that um, are sweet and dispersed by birds. So the seeds sort of look like they're within a fruit. It's not a true fruit at all. So it's a gymnosperm. This is Needham montanum, which is one of the vines or lianas in the genus. Ephedras, um, so a couple different species of ephedras. Uh, the one on the left is a male plant of ephedra americana producing pollen. And on the right is a female plant of ephedra intermedia um, producing ovules and little cones. 
Ephedra, this is ephedra being grown as a rock garden plant in New York City. Um, ephedra is the only genus in the neophytes that has really any other economic use aside from kind of niche horticulture. Um, so it is grown as a rock garden plant, but it is important uh, as a source of pharmaceuticals as well. So ephedra is the original source of ephedrine and pseudephedrine. And these are alkaloid chemicals that are powerful stimulants and also um, decongestants and cough suppressants. So they're used in cold medicine. Um, these chemicals are also kind of notorious because they're the starting material for making methamphetamine. So methamphetamine is uh, chemically modified uh, from these alkaloid chemicals that are naturally found in ephedra plants. So the evolution section of the talk, I'll talk about the fossils, convergence with flowering plants, similarities with flowering plants, and the, the phylogeny, the, the evolutionary tree of uh, seed plants and where Welwichia comes out on that tree. So the fossil record of the neophytes is uh, starting in the Triassic period, the, the earliest period in the Mesozoic, the age of the dinosaurs. Uh, well, which uh, pollen and seeds and bits of cones have been found pretty much worldwide. And this is uh, 250 million years ago. The peak in diversity and abundance of neophytes in the fossil record is in the Cretaceous period. So the, the end period of the Mesozoic 145 to 66 million years ago. And really exceptional fossils that seem to be closely related to Oichia are, um, are known from the early Cretaceous in Brazil, especially. There's a little bit about those fossils here. Um, so these are fossils from the Crato Formation in Brazil, which is 112 million years old. And uh, it's uh, three sorts of things that are thought to be allied to Oichia. Well, which you fill them are these strap like leaves on the left hand side here, um, quite similar to Oichia leaves, uh, but only ever found disarticulated from any stems or anything. Um, well, which you strobos is these cones, which are obviously neophytes and uh, probably more closely related to Oichia than anything else. So, uh, fairly similar to the cones of modern Oichia, actually. And uh, Wilwichiella or Prisco Wilwichia is these funny blob things with two leafy things coming off of them, which people have interpreted as seedlings of a Wilwichia type plant. That seems a little bit dubious. Um, they may be winged seeds or something like that instead. It's a little bit uncertain how all three of these things fit together, but uh, the main, the, the primary, most common interpretation seems to be that they uh, were on some kind of tree-like plant. So more of an ordinary tree, maybe something like one of the tree needums, but with, with Wilwichia type leaves growing from the stems. There's a nice specimen of Wilwichia, unfortunately obscured by this uh, pterosaur skull. Um, if you'd like to find out more about pterosaurs, contact your nearest precocious third grader. So the seed plants, uh, there's five living lineages of seed plants, um, including the neophytes, which Wilwichia belongs to. Um, there's a lot of extinct groups as well, uh, extinct gymnosperm groups. Um, so the five living lineages of seed plants are the division Magnoliophyta, which is the flowering plants, and then four divisions of uh, gymnosperm plants. Cycadophyta is the cycads. There's about 300 species. Uh, division Ginkophyta is just a single species, Ginkgo biloba. Pinophyta is the largest group of gymnosperms. These are the conifers, and there's about 630 species. It's the most diverse group of conifers, and also probably the most ecologically important group of uh, uh, surviving uh, gymnosperms is the conifers. Uh, especially in the North Temperate regions, uh, it can be, the, the conifers can be quite dominant in a way that other gymnosperms tend not to be. But uh, 
in terms of species diversity and also in terms of ecological dominance over most of the world's surface. Uh, the magnoliophyta or the angiosperms or flowering plants are really the most important living group. And finally, the Nitophyta is about 120 species. The majority of those are ephedras. Um, there's also about 50 species of Needham in the one well which you, of course. So pop quiz, which one of these is a Nitophyte and which one is a flowering plant? And uh, you can say your answer out loud so you can't cheat later on. Um, the neophytes and the flowering plants share a lot of similarities. And these days it's thought that this is probably due to convergence or the development of similar evolutionary adaptations in uh, basically unrelated groups. Um, but in the past, I'd say probably throughout the 20th century, uh, there was a really dominant idea that the neophytes were the closest living relatives of the flowering plants. This really hasn't held up with modern research though. So Needham is on the left and on the right is coffee, a flowering plant. So the, just the cones, the reproductive structures of neophytes, including Woolwichia, uh, bear kind of a striking resemblance to flowers. So this is a close up of a male Woolwichia cone with a whirl of microsporangia on little stalks. It look an awful lot like the whirl of stamens that occurs in flowers of angiosperms. And there's even a sterile vestigial ovule in the center of the Noelwichia the flower-like structure on the cones. Um, so it it's, has at least a superficial resemblance to a bisexual flower in a flowering plant. Um, there are differences though. It's an ovule in the center. It's not a carpal like it would be in an angiosperm. It's just a naked vestigial seed in the center of these male flowers. Um, it's also these uh, pollen producing structures have three chambers. They have three microsporangia at the tips of these little stalks. And in flowering plant, the plants, there's only two chambers, two microsporangia that produce pollen. And it seems like a minor difference, but it's actually quite consistent. Um, it's very consistent in flowering plants. That's their basic structure. And it's not the same in uh, Wellwitchy and its relatives. I've got to say a little bit about uh, embryology and seed plants. It's, uh, it's a rabbit hole. There's a lot to it. Um, this could go on for a while. But I'll say briefly that flowering plants have something called double fertilization, where uh, a pollen grain will produce two uh, sperm nuclei that carry out fertilization with two cells inside the uh, ovules of the female plant. And one of those fertilizations gives rise to an embryo, and which will be the new plant inside of the seed. And the other fertilization give, gives rise to endosperm, which is a very specialized nutrient storage tissue. And some neophytes have something a little bit similar to this. Uh, Ned Friedman, who I cite here for uh, the photograph, is uh, one of the modern researchers who studied this quite a bit. And he's uh, the husband of Pam Diggle, who is my department head, so I do have to mention this stuff. Um, but uh, neophytes have something a little bit similar to double fertilization in some cases, but it doesn't seem to be really controlled. It never gives rise to anything like endosperm it does give rise to multiple embryos if it does happen. So it's something a little bit similar to flowering plants, but again, the, the details are not quite right. And you also see that kind of similarity, but with different details in the xylem tissue of neophytes uh, versus angiosperms. And xylem tissue is the uh, water transporting tissue in the stems and the leaves. And Nidophytes are unusual among gymnosperms is that they have both tracheids, which are smaller diameter cells, which have, uh, are completely enclosed in a cell wall and water has to diffuse through the cell wall at the ends in order to be transported. And they also have vessel elements, which are larger diameter cells, which uh, have actual perforations in their end walls, which enable the water to flow directly through. So the 
their vessel elements stack on top of each other and form a little pipe. And uh, you find vessel elements in angiosperms and flowering plants, and also in this odd group of gymnosperms, including Wellwichia. Um, so the details are again, not quite right. The perforation plate, the perforations at the end of the cell wall develop in a somewhat different way in neotophytes versus angiosperms. And other characteristics of the xylem and neotophytes are actually kind of similar to the water transporting tissue in pine trees, um, which is suggestive as well. And so I'd say as of 10 years ago or so, there was kind of two live interpretations about how the neotophytes were related to the rest of the seed plants. Uh, the amphiphyte hypothesis was really dominant through most of the 20th century, I'd say. And that's that neophytes are the closest living relatives of the flowering plants. And this is uh, versus what has been termed the nepine hypothesis, which is that neophytes are closely related to the pine family and not to the flowering plants. So I think modern research and especially uh, DNA sequence based evolutionary work has uh, supported the nepine hypothesis and pretty much ruled out the amphiphyte hypothesis. So I'll move through this uh, pretty quickly, I hope. Um, it's a complicated diagram. A few of the takeaway points you should get from it is that Needham and Wellwichia are the closest living relatives of each other. Um, so that those uh, broadly used uh, tropical rainforest plants are the closest living relatives of Wellwichia. The Fedra is a little bit more distantly related, but the Nutales, the Nidophytes are a natural group. They're a monophyletic group. And that much has been known pretty well for the past 150 years. What's uh, has really shaken out in the past, just in the past few years, this is a paper from uh, 2018, but there are a lot of similar publications recently, is that the Nutales uh, come out most closely related to the pine family. So it's not even that the uh, neophytes are more closely related to the conifers than they are to flowering plants. They are actually a type of highly specialized, unusual conifer. Um, pine trees are actually more closely related to Elwichia than pine trees are uh, to a lot of other conifers like yew trees or uh, metasequoia, the dawn redwood or California redwood. Um, it's, uh, this is group of the pine trees and the neophytes uh, form a closely related group. Ginkgo and the cycads are more distantly related. Um, the uh, angiosperms, the flowering plants, turn out to be very distant, re distantly related to all of the living gymnosperms, and uh, so not closely related to any living gymnosperm group, and kind of equally related to all the living gymnosperm groups. So the origin of the angiosperms is uh, sort of frustratingly far back in time with a, enough extinction between now and then that uh, it uh, doesn't have any close living relatives, the flowering plants. Uh, this is uh, from the same paper, but with uh, some dates attached to the divergence events between these different groups uh, based on molecular clock evidence, which gives you sort of a rough idea of when these divergence events took place. And this shows, here's the neophytes again. Um, they diverged uh, in a, they diverged from the other seed plants uh, back in the Triassic uh, during the uh, beginning of the age of the dinosaurs, which is kind of what people would have expected. Uh, the divergence between Needham and Wellwichia is in the Cretaceous later on in the Mesozoic, the age of the dinosaurs. Um, the flowering plants are coming back way back in the Devonian is when they diverged from the uh, rest of the seed plants. So they're just very distantly related to anything that's alive today, which is uh, why the origins of the flowering plants have been so mysterious. They're what, it's what Darwin called his abominable mystery where the flowering plants came from. Um, they turn out to be an extremely ancient lineages, lineage, which has uh, diversified quite a bit during the Mesozoic and up to the present day. But um, yeah, the origin of the group leading to flowering plants was uh, before the Carboniferous coal swamps 
and like 100 million years before the beginning of the age of dinosaurs. So it's a very ancient group. Okay, so I'll finish off the talk with uh, some cultivation tips. As you might expect, Wawachia needs very strong light in order to do well. And it's uh, probably one of the main factors in uh, growing a healthy Wawachia is providing it with enough sun. Um, in really hot, sunny areas, uh, if you're living in Phoenix or somewhere, you probably have to provide your Wawachia with some shade. But uh, for most of us, they can take just about as much light as we can give them. Uh, they're warm season growing plants. They are tropical plants again. Um, they can tolerate cooler winter night temperatures. I'd say more so than a lot of the, say, other tropical succulents that you might grow, like uh, Madagascar euphorbios or pacopodiums that do poorly when the night temperature gets too cold in the wintertime. Well, which you can tolerate temperatures down to 10 C or 50 Fahrenheit quite easily. It doesn't necessarily grow much at that, that sort of temperature, but uh, they, they definitely grow best in the summer months when temperatures are hot, but uh, they can tolerate a certain amount of winter cold. Uh, they need quite regular feeding and I use uh, water soluble uh, balanced fertilizer like 2010-20. Um, and you should, you know, I have a recipe here, 2010-20 uh, at 200 parts per million nitrogen. You can use just ordinary houseplant fertilizer, diluted according to the directions in the label is fine, but they should be fertilized fairly often. I'd say a couple of times a month at least during the warm season when they're growing. And I can't really emphasize enough that a lot of Wawichias die from lack of water. I've very rarely seen a mature Wawichia plant that died from too much water in cultivation. So especially in the warmer months, you've got to keep your Wawichias well watered. Um, they can be kept, uh, you know, like some codiciform plants, they can be treated almost like a tropical house plant, um, more like a tropical house plant than a succulent plant, uh, watered whenever the soil is starting to dry out at the surface and definitely never allowed to dry out completely, even in the winter time. They need a lot less water in the winter time, but they shouldn't be allowed to get bone dry. And uh, just to emphasize that point again, there, here's a well which you have, they got a little bit of sun scald in the early summer when it was, uh, maybe somebody forgot to water it for a week and uh, the leaf died back quite a bit. This plant eventually did come back. Uh, it grew from that basal meristem eventually again and produced new leaf tissue. Uh, but it's easy to let plants uh, get so dry, especially in warm weather that they, that you lose them completely. If the leaf dies back completely, and the basal meristem dries out, uh, the plant is finished. Soil, sort of any ordinary cactus and succulent soil is fine for Wawachia. Whatever you've got that works well for your other succulent plants will probably be fine for your Wawachia plants. Um, this is a, you know, this is a recipe that I put up here. I, I, you don't need to follow this recipe exactly. I realize that people are from all over the world in this talk. And what's available to you is gonna vary quite a bit from place to place, but you want something like a soilless potting mix that will hold some water and nutrients. And you wanna amend that with a lot of sharp coarse sand and other coarser inorganic materials, mineral materials like pumice or sponge rock or decomposed granite. Um, there's a lot of different possibilities that people use. This is just sort of a general cactus and succulent recipe. You don't need to follow it exactly. Like I said, these plants do grow in a lot of different soil types and pHs in their habitat and uh, are apparently quite adaptable as far as soils go. Artificial light, people do try and grow well, which he is uh, under uh, you know, LED lights in a sort of grow rack type setup. You'd obviously run into space limitations fairly quickly uh, with a tabletop set up or a, a shelving unit with uh, smaller LED grow lights on it. But people do it and the, the plants uh, seem to enjoy it pretty well, at least for a while. In larger setups, like uh, this is a, a greenhouse in New Jersey, a private collection, which had a lot of tree shade. And uh, the guy was using uh, uh, high pressure sodium lights in order to provide some supplemental light. So in grow room setups or shaded greenhouses, 
but which you do appreciate some supplemental lighting, especially during shadier weather and uh, darker times of the year. Uh, pests are pretty un unimportant in Moetia. Unfortunately, um, the plants are relatively resistant to insect pests, it seems like. Um, you do occasionally see things like cactus scale here on Moetia leaves or a few citrus mealybugs. It's usually so few insects, they don't seem to do well on Moetia that you can just uh, crush them physically or wipe them off with alcohol or something like that. I don't think I've ever really uh, resorted to using pesticides on my Wilwichia plants. Uh, similar insects, there are native scale insects and uh, mealybugs that live in uh, the Namib Desert that sometimes can be found on Wilwichia there. Okay, so there's a number of myths and legends that have accumulated around growing Wilwichia. Uh, one of the best known is that the plants uh, have to be potted up in these kind of crazy arrangements where people have taken uh, ceramic uh, earthenware uh, drain tiles and cemented them onto pots and made these giant tall pots to accommodate the uh, taproot of the plants. And this is not really necessary. It's kind of fun to see this in the botanical garden, but it's uh, not practical. It makes it uh, very difficult to work with the plants. You can't repot them easily when they're in their when they're in a setup like this. And it's uh, probably not tremendously practical. So pots of ordinary proportions or tree pots, which are extra tall pots meant for growing plants with deep tap roots uh, are commercially available and uh, are good for growing Wawichia, but yeah, even standard pots are fine. Um, Wawichias do like a fairly large root run. Um, they grow better if they have a lot of root space. So I would, Whatever style of pot you use, I'd use a fairly large one. Kind of related to that is the urban legend that Wilwichia can never be transplanted or it'll, it'll die. Um, again, not true. And uh, you find sometimes people have taken their Wilwichia uh, seedling in a little plastic pot and just sunken the whole plastic pot into a larger pot. And uh, and, you know, based on this myth that you can never transplant the plants or they would die. And uh, that constricts the roots and it's uh, sort of a bad situation for the plant, I think. You can certainly transplant even fairly large uh, potted Wilwichia plants. Um, you need to be a little bit more careful about the roots than with other succulent plants. You can't treat them like a mammalaria where you can knock off all the soil and leave the plant out to dry for a few days and pot it up in dry soil and let it sit dry for two weeks while the roots heal over. That definitely will not work with Wilwichia. Um, the plants die if the roots dry out too much, uh, but with a little bit of care and you don't wanna let the roots dry out, you don't wanna disturb them too much, but you can certainly transplant even mature Wilwichia plants if you can knock them out of the pot with their root ball intact. The third urban legend is uh, that you need to fill up the bottom of the pot with coarse material, broken clay pots or uh, large gravel or large pumice in order to improve drainage. This actually has the opposite effect in pots in general. Um, any kind of discontinuity in the soil uh, can lead to what's called a perched water table where water accumulates uh, midway down in the soil column above some kind of discontinuity in the pore size in the pot. So the, the one on the left, the plant has been potted up with a lot of so-called drainage material in the bottom of the pot. And uh, that inhibits the movement of water through the pot and also inhibits the growth of roots. And you sort of wind up making a smaller, shallower pot. Um, so it's very tempting if you're filling up a large pot to put in something lightweight, and highly porous in the bottom of the pot, if only to uh, make the pot lighter and easier to deal with. But it's best to incorporate any lightweight material into the soil mix uniformly and just pot up the plant uh, with a very uniform soil mix from the top to the bottom is the best way to do it for the best drainage and best uh, growth of the plant roots. Uh, propagation in Wellwichia is uh, Straightforward, it's only from seed. People have experimented with growing Wawichia from uh, tissue culture. 
as far as I know, people have been working on that since the 1970s. And as far as I know, it's never really gotten to the point where people have real uh, tissues or uh, embryos developing in culture and are able to multiply the shoots and bring them out of culture. And that results in a healthy plant living on its own in the greenhouse and the pot. Um, it hasn't been perfected yet. Um, I don't know if it's impossible, but uh, as far as I know, nobody has succeeded in really propagating Wawichu in tissue culture. But the seeds are straightforward if you can acquire them. Um, they can be potted in the same mix as adult plants, uh, best in the spring or early summer as it's starting to get warm at the start of the growing season. Uh, the seeds are fairly large, can be planted about a centimeter deep, you know, sort of a knuckle knuckle length uh, deep. And uh, the seeds appreciate the same sorts of conditions as the adult plants, uh, warm temperatures, full sun, good air circulation. And uh, the mix should be kept moist in order to encourage germination and develop a taproot. Uh, the real, oh, way. the real uh, sort of bottleneck bottleneck in uh, growing Wawichia from seed and propagating the plants is, uh, well, I guess acquiring the seed, but also damping off or fungal diseases or fungus-like diseases that can affect seedlings are just a ridiculously bad problem in Wawichia seedlings. This is by far the most common uh, way that Wawichia seedlings die off is they get damping off. Uh, infections, probably mainly of pythium, which is a fungus-like organism that causes uh, rotting of young seedlings. This is a Wawichia seedling that has gotten damping off. The top has gotten shriveled up and wilted, and there's no way this can recover from this. This is a goner at this point. I don't usually use uh, fungicides in a preventative way in my collection, but I think Wawichia seed, seed raising is a uh, a place where you've got to make an exception for that and use a, use a broad spectrum fungicide when you're planting Wawichia seeds in order to have the best chance of getting a healthy seedling. It's, a, it's funny, after about six months or so, the seedlings are pretty much bulletproof as far as fungal diseases go. They don't seem to have problems at all once they reach a certain age. Um, and adult plants, uh, it's very rare to have one die from uh, excessive watering or fungal diseases. Uh, doesn't really seem to happen very much, but for some reason, the young seedlings are just so susceptible. Uh, pollination, I mean, if you've reached the point where you've got multiple mature well which she is, you can probably figure out how to pollinate them. Uh, but I'll mention that the, the female cones do produce pollination drops at the tips of these filamentous extensions of the ovules. And that's where pollen should be placed um, if you're cross-pollinating two plants. Um, and these pollination drops appear just at certain times of the day. They appear kind of midday and last in the hotter parts of the afternoon. And they, they disappear at night. They're reabsorbed at nighttime if, uh, if there's any pollination drop or nectar left at the tip of the ovule. It, uh, it gets reabsorbed by the plant every night. And then it'll then it'll reappear the next day. Uh, just a few sources. Uh, not all of these places have Wilwichia seeds or plants in stock right now, but uh, these are places just that I have experience with in the past that I've dealt with or that I know by reputation that I know to be reliable. I'm sure there's many other nurseries that offer Wilwichia plants. I debated on whether to include this slide at all. Um, I do have cones in my Wilwichia plants at Yukon right now. And I'm pollinating them right now, not at the exact moment, but today I will. And uh, I hope to produce some seed. And in the past, I have donated seed to the CSSA and it's appeared in the seed depot. So that, that might be a good source come October or so when the seeds should be ripe from pollinations this month. And further reading, there's a lot of technical papers on Wellwichia, which I covered a few of during the talk. Um, there's two, uh, Sort of, uh, sort of broader interest books, books at the interest level of the general public who's interested in biology and botany and uh, Wellwichia. There's Wellwichia by Chris Borman in 1978, out of print, obviously, but uh, 
available from used booksellers, including Silver Hill Books, which I mentioned in the last slide, and uh, Ernst van Jarsveld and Ushi Pond in 2013 uh, wrote a new monograph about Wellichia, The Uncrowned Monarch of the Namib, which is quite an excellent book, uh, beautiful photographs, which you saw a few of during my talk, which they lent me, um, highly recommended. There are a few copies. I talked to Ushi. Um, he does have a few copies left, which can be ordered through the website of the publisher, penrock.co.za. All right, that's my talk. I went a little bit over, but maybe we have some time for questions. Before we go to the questions, thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. Let's all give, uh, let's all give Matt a big hand for, for the presentation. Very, very, very. I see a number of questions uh, in the queue here. And uh, Irvin, you want to start off with a question? Um, late getting to the queue, OK. Or maybe Rod, it's up to you. Um, one person asked, are there commercial uses, any commercial uses for well with you? Are they only ornamental and cultural? No, yeah, strictly a specialist ornamental. Um, like I said, the cones of well witchy at least are edible and they are eaten as a cooked vegetable. Um, it's not, not a commercial use, I'm sure, but uh, it is uh, a native use of the plants uh, in their native environment. I have a question that occurred to me because the germination seems um, separated by decades in many cases. What's the, the life of the seed in, in the seed bank situation? Yeah, it's, I know that seeds in storage um, can last, you know, quite easily, at least a couple of years, even in not very careful seed storage conditions uh, without air conditioning. Um, they, they probably form a bit of a seed bank in the wild based on the reports that I've seen. Mm -hmm. um, you do get these mass germinations of well witches in uh, especially wet years. And so I, I think there, there is probably a supply of seed in the soil, something of a seed bank that must last from year to year. And uh, all these seeds just ready to go if they get enough water. So it's, uh, the seeds don't seem to be short-lived. They seem to be fairly long-lived. Matt, how big do they get in cultivation? The largest ones that I've seen, you know, it's, I'm not sure if I've heard of many plants in cultivation that are more than about 50 years old or so. And those get to have a, a caudex, a, you know, stem at their base that's, you know, maybe dinner plate size, thereabouts, a little bit larger. Um, so, yeah, I've seen the, like the plants at Kirsten Bosch are quite old. Uh, some of the plants in California are you know, maybe on the order of 50 years old at some of the universities and botan botanical, botanical gardens. My oldest plant at Yukon is about 30 years old. Um, and that's, uh, you know, dessert plate size anyway, the stem. Another person asked, has anyone been successful in established uh, cultivated plants in a landscape? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. Probably some of you caught the talk uh, a month or two ago by Ernst van Jarsfeld, the real expert on these sorts of things, in habitat at least. Um, he's uh, working at a private nursery now where he's planting Wellwichia seeds outside uh, near Cape Town. Um, and uh, I guess having some luck with that, I've heard of people growing them uh, in the landscape in Southern California and Arizona, places that are relatively frost-free, probably with some protection and some extra water. As far as I know, there's, I don't know if there's anywhere in the world where the conditions out in the wild are such that it could be naturalized or established. Uh, I've never heard of uh, anybody establishing them sort of outside of a garden situation outdoors. And, you know, even in this, uh, private garden near Cape Town that EVJ is working on this Wauwichia plantation outdoors. He's got heating cables underground to keep them warm enough during the winter time. He covers them over, I guess, for, to protect them from the winter rains uh, in that climate to make sure they don't get too wet and chilly in the winter time. Um, but yeah, it's uh, definitely can be done, but uh, 
probably with a, a fair amount of tending. They, they need a, a, a lot of TLC if they're planted out in the ground and in, in an appropriately warm climate. At, in uh, your presentation, there were some very old plants that look to have more than two leaves. Right, are those, yeah. Are those multiple leaves or are they multiple plants? Right. It's are probably they... in most of those cases, like the big well, which here, um, with, which has got the fence around it, that one. Um, it's almost certainly just a single plant, but it's been alive for so long and the, uh, the rim of the stem where the leaf is attached has sort of gotten so convoluted and lobed and uh, just been around for so long that the, the plant has uh, gotten to the point where it looks like kind of multiple stems and a whole pile of stems, but it's really just one plant. I should have mentioned this, the, the leaves, even on say, you know, 30 or 50 year old plants, the leaves tend to kind of break up into strips and it, it looks like more than two leaves, but it's really just two leaves where they've broken up into strips and uh, you get kind of uh, separate, separate areas of the meristem producing separate strips of leaf, but all derived from the same original two, two leaves. So How cold does it in the mid at night, Matt? Aside from when they have uh, their fertile shoots, which do branch a little bit. Sorry. How cold does the Namib get at night? Is that a limiting factor for where they grow? Yeah, it could very well be. So Oichia doesn't occur in the southern parts of the Namib desert where it's cooler and it doesn't include, it doesn't occur in the, the really high areas that might receive frost as far as I know. Um, yeah, it does seem to be limited by temperature to some extent in its native environment, I would imagine. Uh, I think the areas where it grows either don't receive frost at all, or maybe just very light frosts. Mm. Um, it's, uh, in the coastal areas of the Namib, it, it doesn't get down to freezing at all. It never freezes. And I have another question about seed production. I assume you have to have enough plants so you can get both male and female cones occurring at about the same time. You're not gonna right. just have two plants and have that happen, right? Yep. Yeah, I mean, I've definitely had some years where I've failed in seed production just because I haven't had a male plant flowering or mm -hmm. I said it, I shouldn't have said that. Producing <laughs> cones. <laughs> it's irresistible to call those things flowers, but they aren't. Um, yeah, I've had a, definitely had some years where I've had only one sex uh, producing cones and uh, not gotten seed that way. Uh, that, that happened last year. I had uh, female cones, but no male cones. So I've got some dried up old female cones that don't have any seeds in them. They just never got pollinated. Um, so yeah, it's a, sort of an interesting question, which I've thought about. I don't know if anybody's gonna bring this up, but it seems like maybe there's more male plants out there than female plants. I haven't seen any real data on that. I don't know if it exists. But uh, it seems like male plants are a little bit more common than females. Um, not sure if that's true or not. I haven't seen any good demographics on that. Yeah, another question. Uh, Notice that plants in the coastal areas were large, but apparently not reproducing. Right. Is that the case? Yeah, not reproducing much. Mm -hmm. um, like in the, the Wawichia flat, flats areas in uh, central Namibia, um, it's, uh, you know, these large coastal plants and very arid conditions and not a lot of reproduction, but a little bit maybe. If you look around enough, apparently you can find a few younger plants, but it doesn't happen often. Um, I think... Uh, in the 1970s, there was good rains in some parts of Namibia, and there's uh, some Wilwichia plants even in the dry coastal regions that can be dated from then. And in the 1930s, there was good rains, and there's some populations that seem to date from then, in, uh, even in these arid areas. But yeah, apparently in these coastal areas among the giant Wilwichias, they don't reproduce much. They produce plenty of seed, they shed a lot of seed probably just about every year, the female plants, but uh, 
it's very rare that conditions are such that the seeds can get established. A question along those lines would be, do you find areas where the plants are growing their roots down to the water table or not? I'm not sure. Um, I, I'm not sure if they actually reach a, an actual water table or not. Um, it'd be interesting to know, but uh, I don't know that offhand. I suspect not. I suspect the actual water table in these areas is uh, very deep indeed. And uh, they're, they're more just uh, kind of tapping leftover moisture in the deeper layers of the soil um, from, you know, that may have been concentrated by runoff from rocks or concentrated in mostly dry riverbeds. Um, but that's, that's not really a water table where free water is, would be available for a dug well. What plants or other succulents are associated with the growing areas of Wawichia? Quite a few things, um, you know, especially outside of the, the moonscapes near the coast. Um, but uh, uh, what is it? Monsonias, the pelargonium relatives, there are some species that grow in Wawichia habitats. Uh, uh, Zygophyllums, um, sort of succulent leaves on those grow in the area as well where well, which he grows. Um, uh, Comiferas grow in some of these same areas. Um, I think especially in the more Northern and inland parts of uh, the Wawichia habitats, it's uh, not quite as barren of other vegetation. Um, and you do find some plants that people are interested in as uh, succulent plants. Let's see, what's the name of Monsonios, uh, the, the Bushman candles. What's the, what's the old genus name for those guys? And there's some aloes. Yeah, Sarka Collins. Somebody wrote it in the comments. It's a great thing about having people on your Zoom talk. Yeah. Here's, here's someone growing and has a question about his method. I'm in Southern California growing my well with you in an eight inch wide PVC pipe about three feet high. Yeah. It's sitting in a basin with one inch of water. It seems to be thriving. <laughs> Yep. Any apprehension, apprehension regarding that cultivation? No, not really. I mean, aside from the thing where you're going to have a heck of a time repotting it, uh, <laughs> if, it ever, if it ever outgrows its PVC pipe. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it should work. Presumably that, that water table at the bottom of the pot is down low enough that it's not rotting out the roots or anything. And that, that's fine. It's, if it works for you, it's good. But yeah, it's, you're going to have a heck of a time when you go to repot that if it ever outgrows that container. <laughs> but you know, it's possible. Like I said, just you'd have to go about it kind of carefully, not damage the roots too too much. Okay, I I still see 23 questions in the queue here, but uh, I think maybe we have time for maybe for one more. So. Uh, Matt, either you can pick one or you can ask, ask us to pick one and we'll, we'll call it a day. Let's see. Well, it's an interesting question. The one Galaxy Tab says, how do seedlings germinate and keep growing in the desert, the dry desert, if they have to remain moist? And so I think you should cover that, Matt, because it, you know. Right, yeah, I mean, it's definitely that, coming back to that point that I made about the plants only establishing in their natural habitat during um, extremely high rainfall years. Um, it, it seems like the, the seedlings need to have enough time where there's uh, water in the shallower parts of the soil, there's soil moisture available right up at the surface, uh, that they can uh, tap that water and get their root down good and deep uh, before drought comes again. So again, they'll only establish uh, during kind of freakishly heavy rainfall years. But you mentioned in cultivation, you need to keep it wet, deep and damp in the warm weather. And I mean, there's years where there's no rain at all. In the right. And they, they do get f that fog as well. So, you know, that's providing the plants with a bit of moisture. It's uh, providing a little bit of moisture in the upper soil levels and possibly directly to the plant. Um, but yeah, they, they seem to do well enough uh, in these extremely arid areas, but as long as they've got their deep taproot, that provides them enough water to keep their leaves alive. But you know, you'll find out if you've got a plant in a uh, eight inch pot 
uh, that there's only so much drying out that it can take uh, before it croaks. And it's not all that much. Uh, in, in the yeah, wild. They've got free run of the soil and they can get their roots down deep. They're much more resistant to uh, arid conditions. Is there any indication that in the wild, in addition to their tap roots, some of the plants also have shallow roots to collect fog generated moisture? Yes. So, I mean, all the plants, uh, Wellwichia plants, uh, given free root run, they do have roots near the surface as well. Okay. Um, so it's not only that deep tap root, they do have a uh, fairly shallow uh, superficial roots in uh, the, the surface layers of the soil. Well, I mean, we could probably talk about this all day because there's no limit to the questions. I know I still have a lot, but we won't take up your time. Well, here's an interesting observation from Murray West. The oldest in cultivation is at Stellenbosch ah. from 1926, about two oh. feet across. Good okay. information there. Yeah, good. Yeah. <coughs> all right, before we leave, uh, Rod, any other comments? That was wonderful. It's always been one of my favorite plants, and I've killed a few. So <laughs> thank you for showing us how to do it right. All right. Yeah. So Urban? I've killed a few as well. <laughs> Enjoyed, Matt. Always look forward to your talks. Okay. Thank you very much. Doc? Yeah. Fantastic. We were fortunate enough to get to the well, which is outside of Swakopmund uh, several years ago, and it's fantastic there. Just so unbelievable. There's nothing else growing in most of the areas where they grow. And uh, there they are. And they're old, old, old plants. Yeah. Great talk. Fantastic. Good. A lot of wonderful comments, uh, Matt, and I'll share those with you a little bit later on here. All right, folks, we're about done here. We'll see you again in two weeks. Uh, uh, and uh, that's about it. All right. We'll have a nice Saturday, okay? Somebody Thanks. Goodbye, everyone. Bye, Bye everyone. Thanks for having me. I'll see you later. <laughs>